Hey guys, have you ever wondered how someone could just disappear off the face of the earth? Well today, I'm here to tell you about Brandon Swanson, the 19 year old from Marshall, Minnesota, who went disappearing on March 14th, 2008 and was never heard from again. So Brandon was a 19 year old from Marshall, Minnesota. Uh, he lived with his mother Annette, his father Brian, and his little sister Jemine. And they, he was described as a very sweet, very kind, um, reliable, trustworthy kid. And he loved to read and debate and he loved politics and music. And he loved the Minnesota Twins. And he actually worked at the local grocery store for four years and was in the bakery for two of those years. And um, on March 14th, 2008, uh, Brandon went to a graduation party at one of his high school friends' house, houses, and he ended up never coming back home. So he left his parents' house at about six o'clock and he drove to Lind, which is about a, an 11 minute drive from Marshall. And it was just a small get together. There were a couple of his high school friends there. Um, and he was in college at the time. He was studying wind engineering and he was planning on getting a degree in science. And he was actually planning on transferring from the community college that he was at to a college in Iowa to continue to get his degree in science. While he was at the house party with his high school friends, his friends said he had probably a couple drinks, but he wasn't overly intoxicated. So he left the party at himself by himself at uh, 10.30. And he went to another friend's house in Canby, Minnesota, and just to say goodbye to his former classmate, because he was planning on leaving. And he probably had, and they said that he probably had about one drink at this party. So at uh, 12 a.m., 11.30 a.m., he left that party to go home. And normally it's a 30, 35 minute drive from Canby to Marshall if you go on Route 68. But he drove that daily so he knew those roads and he decided to take a back road probably to fly under the radar or just maybe he thought he knew a faster way home so he took the back roads and he ended up getting stuck in in the ditch and the back wheels of his car were off the gravel road so he actually couldn't get back out so he called two or three of his friends by phone because he knew they were around the area. He knew they were at these parties and uh, he couldn't reach any of them. So then at 1.54 a.m. he called his parents and he explained how he got stuck on a gravel road and he was just off Highway 23 between Lind and Marshall. He was explaining exactly where he was and again he was familiar with these roads so he knew where he had gotten stuck. So he let his parents know and they said that he would, that his parents said that they would come and pick him up because they knew where he was. So after his parents had went out to go get him, they said that they were on the road that he was on and they couldn't see him at all. So at 2.15 a.m., uh, his mom called him again and she was saying, well, we don't know where you are. We can't see you. So they decided to um, sit, he decided to sit back in his car and turn the headlights on and try like, flashing them on and off and he was asking do you see me do you see me and in this area it's pretty flat level ground so anyone could have probably seen his lights if they were on the same road as him so they were flashing their lights at each other they still couldn't see each other and um his mom was still like well where are you where are you and later his parents were explaining he didn't sound intoxicated on the phone he sounded completely like himself and he knew he knew what he was saying he knew what he was explaining and he was thinking properly and that he didn't sound intoxicated at all so Brandon sees lights somewhere in the distance and he assumes that it's Lind so he tells his mom I see lights I'm gonna go this way this is where Lind is and I'll meet you at this grocery store in Lind and you can pick me up there. And his parents are saying, okay, well, since we can't see you, yeah, we're gonna try that. So he starts walking toward Lind while his parents drive there. So Brandon's dad, Brian, ended up dropping off Brandon's mom back at home before he drove to the meeting place where Brandon said that he would meet him in Lind. And uh, at 3 a.m., 
uh, Brandon called his dad again and they were just talking on the phone. And Brandon was taking his dad like step by step where he was going. And he said that he was walking down a gravel road and he was just surrounded by fields. And he said, well, I can see the lights that way, whichever direction he was looking. And he decided that he was just gonna cut through the field and go to those lights. So he ended up crossing a couple fence lines um, through these fields and he said, I can hear running water. I'm gonna try to follow the water to get to Lind. And then at 3 a.m., uh, Brandon's dad said he heard something sounding like slipping on the other end of the line and he heard Brandon swear and then the line went dead and Brandon's dad called five or six more times and no one picked up but the phone was still ringing so he assumed well it must be still working so he figured maybe Brandon just dropped his phone or he fell or something so at 6.30 a.m., um, Brandon's mom ended up calling the Pine County Sheriff's Office and reported Brandon as a missing person. Um, the police actually didn't do anything at first because they told Brandon's mom, well, he's 19 years old, 19 year olds go missing all the time, and this obviously made Brandon's parents very upset because they were explaining how he was trying to come home and he was trying to tell his parents, like, I need to come home right now and, like, come pick me up. I'm stuck. And the police were still saying that 19-year-olds go missing all the time. They always come home eventually. So they... After a while, the police decided to go out and look for Brandon, finally, and they ended up finding Brandon's car 20 miles away from where Brandon thought he was. Uh, police officers had taken Brandon's car off the gravel road, and he was actually 25 five miles away from Lind and he was several miles away from Canby so he was really nowhere near he where he was explaining to his parents even though he had given very very clear instructions to his parents where they were and he directed his parents to exactly the location where he thought he was and he knew those roads so he knew that that's where his parents were going to end up and that's exactly where he thought he was but being 25 miles off and in a completely different area that really um set off the case for police so he was a lot closer to the party in Canby than he thought he was but he must have been driving for the same amount of time that it would have taken to get from Canby back to Marshall because then he knew he was lost. So his car was found on the Lincoln County side of the county line and the car was operating, but it wasn't mobile. Again, its tires were off the ground. So we knew that he wouldn't have been able to get unstuck. Uh, it wasn't wrecked, there was there was no damage, and everything was still operating, and he was on the unpaved road, which explains why he couldn't have gotten out of the ditch himself. Um, there was nothing unusual found at the car, no unusual things found, just the car, but um, all of the doors were open, and there were no um, tracks walking away or to the car there was nothing and it was on a gravel road so in theory it, he would have left footprints so there were multiple searches conducted by police and multiple times where they used dogs to uh track brandon down and they used multiple different types of dogs too um and they couldn't really find anything but the dogs did lead them to a river in the woods called the Yellow Medicine River. And the depth of that river ranges from your knee to 15 feet. And 
there was the point in the phone conversation where Brandon said he had heard running water and then there was that slipping sound. But the dogs um, went up to the bank of the river, stepped in and jumped right out right away. So that we have reason to believe that Brandon may have slipped into the river, but he eventually ended up getting out. They searched the river for six hours and they found nothing. Um, the dogs also followed his scent, Brandon's scent, from the car down that gravel road and to a farm. And it was a three mile trail. And that was when they were at the river, the dog jumped in and jumped back out. And then eventually it walked a little bit and then it just stopped, it sat down. And that, that means that it lost the scent. The scent was no longer there. So investigators don't believe that Brandon had drowned in the river because of this and because they found no evidence that Brandon was actually in the river beside the dog jumping in and jumping back out. There were, there, there were multiple dogs who did it too. It wasn't just one dog. It was every dog every time would do the same thing. So back to why Brandon would have been confused in the back roads is that both of these areas branch off of a highway stretch and they both cross a river to get into town and so there's a very good reasons why Brandon would have been 25 miles off of what he thought especially if he may have been drinking a little bit more than people thought at these parties and if somehow that ended up getting him switched up and on a different road than he thought he was on. By July of 2008, Brandon was believed to be deceased and the search for him ended and they decided that if he were to turn up now, it would be a miracle. Private searches were organized uh, after a, the 10 day official search and it prioritized the statistics, algebra, and probability of where Brandon could be. So it was more math based than just walking around in the woods and hoping to find Brandon. Um, they did a 98.5 square mile search area and the call that he had with his dad before his disappearance was the last call that he made and the last contact that someone had with Brandon the last time that somebody talked to him. So they were really relying heavily on that and they were really trying to find his cell phone in hopes that it would somehow lead them to his last known location. Mm -hmm. The police or the private organization who did the search actually drained part of the river and they still didn't find anything from Brandon, not his a shoe, um, a shirt, his cell phone, um, anything from him. So the search that was supposed to be 98.5 square miles ended up being 120 square miles because they found his car so far away from where Brandon was explaining where he was. So this case has actually remained open and um, many leads and theories continue to come forth, but it has also been 11 years since his disappearance, so it's very, very hard to try and collect evidence that would lead to solving this case, because that's really the only objective that Brandon's family and everyone involved in the search still wants to happen. In 2010 of March, the case was actually handed off to a new agency and they have been searching since then. Since Brandon's case has been so huge, there have been many, many theories to arise. And these, this, these next theories that I'm about to talk about, um, they are the very largely believed theories about what could have happened to Brandon and where he could be now. 